Hello everyone, this is John Buck, back for another Discrete Time Linear Systems video. Uh, in this video, we're going to have an introduction to the basic ideas of finite impulse response filter design, or FIR filters as they're often called. The big picture idea for FIR filters is saying I want to design a causal system with a finite length impulse response so that the frequency response in, is a good approximation to some ideal filter I'm trying to build. And we're going to go through the process of how we do that theoretically in this video, and then there's a follow-on video that shows you in MATLAB how we actually implement this for some filters. The first step, though, is you need to, if you should have just seen the video on finding the uh, impulse response for a f uh, ideal frequency selective filter. Uh, so again, uh, pause the video for a second, remember, or, or try to remember, if I have an ideal low-pass filter, what's the impulse response I'm starting from? We need to start from the ideal case to move to the practical. All right, so hopefully you've come back. What type of function do we have for an ideal low-pass filter? Well, again, we can we can get my uh, my first transform blocks out again, and we can see that luckily that one of the other blocks in the set is the ideal low-pass filter. And if I have an ideal low-pass filter like this, we can just rotate the block to see the Fourier transform is the sinc function that looks like this, right? That h of n is the sine of omega naught n over pi n. And so more generally, right, if I have a a rectangle in frequency. I have a sync function in time. Oops, I showed you the wrong face. This is the, this is the plot in time, right? So I go from this in frequency to this in time. And what that means conceptually is that if I have a rectangle in frequency, I get a sync function in time. Okay, so let's see, now that we've reviewed the, the ideal filter, what do we, uh, what does it look like on the whiteboard? Oh. So again, what we just said here is, here is written out that our, our goal, if we're trying to find a filter that looks like this in frequency, is we'll end up with something like this in time. And again, our goal now is, is to, do we want to, the question we're trying to ask, answer is, is how do we uh, find the impulse response, H of n, for a a finite impulse response, say m plus one point causal filter so that the frequency response magnitude is a good approximation to the ideal filter, right? So we don't, we'll see in a minute we can't get exactly this rectangle with a practical filter. So how do we find an impulse response that's a good enough approximation to it? Well, if we're going to do that, there's two practical problems with that sync function I just had up there. But there's two, in terms of implementing this with a filter, one is that if I look at the time axis, this I'm sorry, I should have labeled the zero point, h of n is not zero for negative times. So that means this filter is not a causal filter. So these are, uh, you know, we have two practical issues here. And the first one is that h of n for the sync function is not causal, right? We just saw h of n is not equal to zero for negative time. We say, well, why don't I just shift it and make it causal? Right? I could shift it over and make it causal, but the problem with that is the sync function goes on forever. Right? So it's infinitely long in time. So what that tells me is I can't just shift the ideal response over. I need to do something to make it the shift won't help with the ideal h of n. I need to do something to make it finite length first, and then I can shift it. So that's going to be our design strategy. Let me sort of show you our common approach sort of in cartoons here, and then we'll lay it out a little bit more. Here's a, a common approach for many of the FIR filter design techniques. I'm just going to sort of do this. These things are discrete, but I'm going to sort of draw them as sort of a continuous envelope.
All right, so what, what we do first is we make it finite. So we pick some region and set it to zero outside that region for the infinite version. So again, we should keep this labeled. So this is my h of n. I'm going to take, I'll keep everything, say, between minus l and l so that uh, l is half the total length I want eventually. Well, there's a plus one in there. Um, but the main idea is I, I take the filter and, and keep the middle part, because that's where most of the, the values, where h of n is the biggest, that sort of commonly makes sense. So this is called, we say we truncate the filter. So we're truncating the ideal filter. And once I've done that, right, my new filter now only goes from minus l to l, right? So I have a new filter now once I do this. And this new truncated filter is centered at the same spot, but it looks more like this. Try to get these lined up in time a little better. All right, so it's going from minus L to L. Let's see if I can draw that a little better. And then everywhere else it's zero outside that region. So now by, by truncating it, I now have this this uh, finite length thing. We could say maybe to, we could say that this is we'll call this h sub f i n for finite of n. Right, so this is the one that goes from minus l to l, and there everywhere else it's zero. And then the second step is that we make it causal. We say, well, if I took this thing now and shifted it l points to the right, it would become causal. I'm going to shift right by L, which is M over 2 samples. And when we do that, it will look basically the same, but just at a different time index. So if I do that, right, I'll have something that looks maybe... Maybe a little more like this. Right, and this will be at 0. This will be at 2L, right? because I've, I've shifted them both to the right. And so this will be the M I wanted. So I'll have a, an impulse response now that is finite length. And in some sense, it should be close to what I want, because I kept the biggest values of H of N. Right? It will be centered at L. But it should be a close fit to what I want. And we say, well, what about shifting all this, isn't it going to ruin my frequency response? Well, this is again where we can use properties, right? We say if this is our H causal of N, let's think about, well, H causal and frequency, we just shifted it by L. So it's E to the minus J omega L times the finite frequency response. So if I take the magnitude of both sides here, I say, well, I take a magnitude of the product, I get the product of the magnitudes, right? A very basic result, uh, result from complex variables, that the magnitude of the product of two things is the product of their magnitudes. And then if I think about this e to the minus j omega as a complex number, well, its magnitude, we didn't even bother writing in front, is 1, right? This is all about phase. So, uh, if this term is, is, is just about the phase, I'll have a magnitude of 1. I guess I should. And so the shifting part didn't change the magnitude. We can always shift things in time, and it won't change the magnitude. But it, so that part was OK. We'll see that what has happened to the magnitude, there has been an effect to the frequency response magnitude, but it was caused by the truncation. So again, truncating the ideal impulse response has, actually turns out to have two effects on the filter's frequency response, h of e to the j omega. One, the first important one is the, the amplitude is no longer constant.
right? So we, we or, or said in another way, we're going to add ripples to h of e to the j omega. Unlike potato chips, ripples are not a good thing in your filter, right? We don't want to add ripples to, we can't market those. But they're a fact of life we have to live with, right? Any real filter has them. And the second thing that we've done, besides adding that ripples in the, in the pass band and the stop band, is the transition from pass band to stop band is no longer a cliff, right? It doesn't, in the ideal filter, we just have the edge of that rectangle, we fall straight off the edge. Instead, now we need a finite transition band. which we say is uh, often delta omega wide to get from the pass band to the stop band. We don't have the, the, the abrupt uh, cliff face that we have in the ideal filter. So if we look at how that turns out, one of the impacts of that oh, I could just drag this thing out of my way, but apparently not. Oh, there we go. So if I just sort of draw this as a cartoon, what I end up with might look much more like this than my ideal filter. And so I'm going to have, instead of being the ideal one, I'm going to say I'm going to have some ripple of, uh, within the pass band. So we'll say omega p is the pass band edge. This is, again, for the low-pass filter case, but there's similar notation for the others. And I leave the pass band. I have, this is, again, my transition band. Again, this, this region where the gain is approximately 1 is my pass band. Where it's approximately 0 is my stop band. Del so delta 1 is the pass band ripple. This is our tolerance for how close to 1 we are. We say, well, we can't be exactly 1, but is it you know, within 0 0.01, 0 0.1, 0 0.001, 0 0.05, whatever. We'll see different ripples. And similarly, we'll have a, a stop band ripple. It says if it won't be exactly 0, once we truncate it, the stop band won't be exactly 0, but we can say it's, it's below some value delta 2. Omega s is the uh, stop band edge. Got to. And then again, the, the delta omega is equal to transition band width. This thing is always in my way today. So the width of the transition band is delta omega, is is the difference between those two. So this. From the time I leave the region where I'm almost 1 until the time I get below delta 2, that distance, delta omega, is the width of the transition band. Okay, so this, you know, this is just sort of a cartoon of what a filter looks like. Um, in the next video, oh, let's, yeah, we have to lay out it. So that leads us to our procedure. And then in the next video, I'll show you an example in MATLAB of how we do this. So our, our, our filter design thing, step one is we find the ideal impulse response, so h, we call h sub id for ideal of n, from the ideal frequency response. Usually when we're designing a filter, we know what we want in frequency, but we got to get it back to time. So we do that using the inverse discrete time Fourier transform. Second step, once we have the ideal filter response, is we truncate it. To get a finite response, right? So let's say we'll call that h1 of n for the finite response. I guess I called it h fine on the previous page. But we're not going to use this one for long. We'll just call it h1 of n. So that's the, it's equal to the ideal response for l less than n less than, or from minus l to l, and it's zero otherwise, where 
the total filter length, uh, we'll see it goes from uh, 0 to m, is the length, uh, so that's l is half of that. So again, the second step is that we truncate, and the third step is that we shift to make it causal. by L samples. So we shift it by L samples to make the filter causal. And so by the time we finish that, our sync function could look something like this. symmetric because we're, we're doing that we usually design them to make them look symmetric except you know these are actually you know like a stem function samples and this thing will start at zero be centered at l and finish at m so we we'll say overall if it goes from zero to m it's m plus one points long and to start with here we're going to always assume m is even is an even number it doesn't have to be but it complicates some of the bookkeeping if it's not, and it doesn't really change the big picture idea. So, so sort of as a basic getting started, this should be negative again to be symmetric there. As a basic thing getting started, uh, we'll assume m is even. Once you get the hang of this, you can go talk about what happens when m is odd, so the length is even. But this is my, my uh, practical filter will look something like this going from 0 to m, and it'll be symmetric at l, and it'll be a truncated version of the ideal frequency response. So I'm going to stop this video here. It's already long enough. The follow-on video, I'll show an example doing this in MATLAB.